Okay, hi everybody. If you've been to one or more of our presentations uh, facilitated by distinguished speakers, you know who I am. Otherwise, my name is Na Trung, Brookhaven College Development Office, Title V. Several years ago, the college received a Department of Education uh, grant to implement activities that support student success, culminating in, among other accomplishments, the opening of the hub, the Comprehensive Student Services Center, which opened in 2018 with centralized services and expanded hours in the S building. This past year, as part of this grant, we received supplemental funding to provide activities for our students that support activism, patriotism, diversity of ideas, free speech, civil discourse, civic engagement, and related topics. As such, we are so excited, or were excited, about all the initiatives for this past year, this semester, including a robust lineup of speakers who deeply engaged us in the important topics just mentioned. So to cap off a successful speaker series for this spring semester, Ambassador Robert Jordan is joining us to speak about free speech and the media in Saudi Arabia. Ambassador Jordan is diplomat in residence and adjunct professor of political science in the John T. G. Tower Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist University. He served in the U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 2002 to 2003 and partner in the international law firm Baker Botts LLP for many years where he headed the Middle East practice in Dubai. He is vice chair of the Tower Center Board of Directors, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, um, and the past president of the Dallas Bar Association and the Dallas Committee of Foreign Relations. He is a member of the panel of distinguished neutrals of the CPR International Institute for Conflict Prevention and resolution. He also serves on the advisory board of the bilateral U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce and is a frequent commentator with the international media including CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and the New York Times. His memoir, Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11, was published in 2015. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Robert Jordan. Well, thanks much. I'm delighted to be here with you today. I, uh, can you hear me okay, I think. I want to uh, start off talking a little bit about the context uh, in which we find free speech, or the lack thereof, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, situation in Saudi Arabia, uh, particularly in light of the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi uh, and the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Now, uh, the introduction mentioned that I had been ambassador uh, in Saudi Arabia. I actually arrived about a month after 9-11. And you may be wondering why as I put it, an innocent lawyer in Dallas, Texas, ended up being ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, the Saudis will not give diplomatic credentials to a career foreign service officer uh, to be the ambassador. They want someone who is a friend of the president, who can get the White House on the phone, who can go over the heads of the bureaucracy, and who does not have a career to protect. And that was me. <laughs> I had been uh, the president's lawyer in the early 1990s. Uh, my engagement with him uh, ended very successfully. He thought I was a genius. I let him keep thinking that. Uh, he was then elected governor of Texas, and we continued to be friends. So we would occasionally spend the night with the Bushes at the governor's mansion and uh, continued that friendship. So he was uh, elected president, of course, in a contested uh, litigated election uh, in the year 2000, before some of you were born. 
uh, and uh, he asked me to serve in his administration. He actually asked me initially to tell him what I would like to do. He said, don't wait for me to suggest something. You tell me what you'd like to do. And I said, well, I had been your lawyer. Uh, perhaps White House counsel uh, would be something we could do. And he said, you'd be great, but I've already selected Alberto Gonzalez for that position. But, he says, our new Attorney General, John Ashcroft, is looking for someone uh, at a very senior level in the Justice Department, either Deputy or Associate Attorney General. He says, go over and see Ashcroft and see what you think. And so I went to see uh, the new Attorney General, and we did not exactly hit it off. It was very clear that uh, he wanted his own people at the senior levels and did not want a Bush guy looking over his shoulder. And so who got the job instead of me? You may have heard of him, a guy named Jim Cohen. <laughs> uh, and so, in my view, that was it. I was happy to return to my law practice here in Dallas. And then suddenly, a month or so later, the White House calls and says the president would like you to be his ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Now, this was about the worst idea I had ever heard. <laughs> I had never been to the Middle East. My father had been in Libya for some time, but I had never been there. Uh, all I knew about Saudi Arabia was a typical stereotype of a hot, dusty place that has no human rights, no women's rights, no religious freedom, uh, and uh, it would be a very unpleasant experience for me. So I mulled it over for several weeks. I couldn't really say no at that point. Finally, my son was in college at the time, and he turned to me one night, on, he was there on spring break, and he said, Dad, you know, when your friend, the President of the United States, asked you to serve your country, you can't say no, can you? And I said, uh, Peter, you're exactly right. I have decided that I am going to take this job. And so I spent the, the spring and summer of 2001 uh, studying, going to Washington two or three days a week, uh, talking to think tanks, basically drinking from a fire hose on the inf information that I needed to have to be an ambassador, and especially to be an ambassador in Saudi Arabia. Of course, this is still before uh, the events of 9-11. And so what was I focusing on? Well, I was focusing on terrorism. We knew there was this guy named Osama bin Laden out there. But we also had many other very important issues uh, with the Saudis. They were a very important strategic partner in the region. Uh, we needed uh, access to their oil, of course. Uh, my instructions were to try to keep oil uh, somewhere around $23 a barrel at that time. And the Saudis wanted 28 we ended up at 25 most of the time I was there. Uh, and then we talked a lot about uh, the other issues. Human rights certainly were issues that we had to deal with. It was difficult to have these conversations with an ally, but we were prepared to do that. And I still had not been formally nominated to be ambassador when the attacks of 9-11 occurred. There's a side story to this. My paperwork was supposed to be submitted to the Senate on September the 7th, but they lost the paperwork, and so they rescheduled the submission for September the 11th. Well, of course, it didn't happen that day. And so the nomination was submitted the next day, September the 12th. And of course, the media made a lot of this. They said, oh, President Bush hasn't had an ambassador in Saudi Arabia until we have now been attacked. Now that we've been attacked, he's finally gotten around to nominate for someone. That ignores, of course, what all of you who have studied political science know, which is these nominations are in process for a great period of time. And it was really taking months for the security clearance, uh, for all the paperwork to be processed, background checks, and so forth. So at any rate, September the 12th comes, I'm nominated, but they are still not providing what's called a confirmation hearing in the Senate. This is because the Senate was occupied by Democrats at that time, and the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee was a guy named Joe Biden, and he was not giving President Bush very many confirmation hearings. Well, of course, after the events of 9-11, this changed. And so Senator Biden at that time said, look, we'll give this guy Jordan a hearing if he promises to immediately go out to Saudi Arabia 
instead of staying behind for language courses, consultations, uh, and so forth. Well, that, of course, was an important deal that we were able to make. And so my confirmation was held, my confirmation hearing was held in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, on about October the 10th. And the, the committee voted uh, affirmatively to refer me then to the entire Senate for confirmation, but it took a few days for this to happen. And I kept wondering and wondering when this was going to happen. Finally, I was sitting in my hotel room one night in Washington, and I'm watching CNN, and scrolled across the bottom of the screen, it says, Robert Jordan confirmed as ambassador of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> this is how I found out. My own government couldn't tell me. And I knew this was an omen. They weren't going to tell me very much unless I dug it out and forced them to tell me. And so I proceeded to land in Saudi Arabia a couple of days later. I was sworn in. Uh, in the State Department by Colin Powell, the Secretary of State. I landed. I met my six new best friends who were my Saudi bodyguards. Now, if people may wonder why it was that the Marines were not my bodyguards instead of Saudi Arabians. But the fact of the matter is, the Marine Corps, some of you may have served in these embassies, the Marine Corps security guards are strictly to safeguard the embassy and its classified material. In the event of an attack, they would certainly be able to repel, but we only had 12 Marine security guards at the embassy in Riyadh. And so the Saudis made a deal with us that they would provide security for me, and we would provide American security guards for Prince Bandar, the Saudi ambassador to the United States in Washington. So I met my six new best friends, and you can imagine, in the wake of 9-11, with the World Trade Center still uh, completely uh, in fumes, what would I think about these Saudi security guards? Were they going to be my best friends or were they going to slit my throat in the middle of the night? Well, it turned out they were extremely loyal. Uh, they were extremely dedicated to my safety and undoubtedly would have stopped a bullet for me. And so I then began to meet people in Saudi Arabia. And the first government official I met was Prince Salman. Prince Salman was the governor of Riyadh at the time, but now, of course, he is the king. And as governor of Riyadh, he was governor for about 40 years. He knew all of the secrets of the Saudi royal family. He knew who was loyal, who was uh, engaged in corruption, who was a security risk, and he was basically the sheriff of the royal family. A very important figure. And I asked him, how could it be that 15 of these 19 hijackers on 9-11 were Saudis? And you know what he told me? He said, oh no, there were no Saudis involved in these attacks. This was an Israeli plot. The Israelis did this to drive a wedge between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Well, I really couldn't believe what I was hearing. It absolutely astounded me. So I went to the next royal figure. This was Prince Naif. Prince Naif was the head of the Ministry of Interior, which is kind of like our FBI. And I asked him the same question, and I got the same answer. There was an Israeli plot. It wasn't until I went to Prince Saud al Faisal, the foreign minister, that I was able to get a straight answer. Now, Prince Saud was the son of the late King Faisal. Uh, he was educated at Princeton. He spoke better English than I did. Uh, and he was a straight shooter. And he said, yes, we have an extremism problem in our midst, and we have to do something about it, but we can't do it without the help of the United States. And so we undertook at that point a lengthy process of trying to fight terrorism, trying to find Al Qaeda cells in Saudi Arabia, uh, trying to uh, cooperate with their intelligence and work through our own intelligence agents to find any weak spots, any uh, extremist threats within Saudi Arabia. And someone else we worked very closely with was Prince Mohammed bin Naif. He was the son of the Prince Naif I just described, the head of the Ministry of Interior. 
and he was the deputy minister who was probably the most accomplished and dedicated counterterrorism figure in the Middle East. Now, why am I telling you all this background? Well, fast forward to 2015, <coughs> King Abdullah passes away, and Prince Salman then becomes king. And he selects as his crown prince the very same Mohammed bin Nayef who we had worked with so closely on counterterrorism. But there's a catch. And the catch is that the king also selected as the deputy crown prince his 29-year-old son, Mohammed bin Salman. Now, Mohammed bin Salman had virtually no government experience, but he was immediately named not only deputy crown prince, but also uh, minister of defense, which his father had occupied. He also created councils to become the head of the entire Saudi economy, as well as their national security apparatus. And it wasn't long before this young 29-year-old deputy crown prince had elbowed aside the crown prince Mohammed bin Nayef, and his father then named him the new crown prince. Mohammed bin Salman is probably now responsible for more press atrocities, more repression of dissent, and more thuggish behavior toward journalists and those who seek freedom than about any other government leader on earth. Freedom House has an index of press freedom. Saudi Arabia last year ranked 169th out of 180 in press countries in press freedom. They've established laws that describe terrorism as anything that is critical of the royal family, the king, or the government. So even the mildest kind of dissent could be punishable by imprisonment, lashes, or even death. They also have blasphemy laws, which encourage the prosecution of anyone who dissents from or even questions the very uh, orthodox, strict form of Islam that is practiced in Saudi Arabia. We call it Wahhabism. It's really a version of Salafist uh, Islam, but it is a it's almost a, uh, a death penalty offense to question uh, any of that. During my time as ambassador from 2001 to 2003, I met a number of journalists, Saudi journalists, and they were by and large a very respectable, dedicated, hardworking bunch of people. And even in those days, while they did not have the same kind of repression and formal legislation that they do today, most of these journalists practice what I would call uh, self-editing or self-censorship. And so they would be very careful to not print something that would be offensive uh, to the royal family, or at least to the, to the senior leadership. Khaled al uh, was one of the editors of the Arab News. The Arab News was, and still is, an English language newspaper published in Riyadh. Uh, which is uh, uh, easy to read. It has a lot of news of the day. It's fairly comprehensive. You can get them online. There was also the Saudi Gazette, also published in English. And there was also a newspaper called Al Watson. And its editor was a fellow I spent some time with named Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal was a gentle soul. Jamal was uh, someone who wanted nothing but the best for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And ironically, he also supported many of the reforms that the current Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has been implementing uh, in the last two years. But in those days, those reforms were not so popular. And so Jamal was fired as editor of Al Watan. I think he was rehired some months or years later and fired again. Several other journalists were also fired from their positions 
But Jamal had a unique capacity. As a young journalist, he had gone to Afghanistan during the time when the Saudis and the Americans were resisting the Russian uh, invasion of Afghanistan. And Jamal interviewed Osama bin Laden. And he asked him many of his views. He ended up becoming very critical of bin Laden and the radicals. But he also spent some time thinking about the Muslim Brotherhood. And he worked very closely with a Saudi prince named Turkey al-Faisal. Prince Turkey was the brother of Saud al-Faisal, the foreign minister I told you about earlier. And Prince Turkey was the head of Saudi intelligence. He was the head of Saudi intelligence actually at the time of 9-11. He resigned shortly after that and was named ambassador to the United Kingdom. And so after Jamal is fired in his editorship of Al Watson, what happens? Prince Turkey then hires him to be his public relations spokesman at the Saudi embassy in London. So you have this bizarre musical chairs going on here where you're fired by the government for one position and then an ambassador of the same government hires you in a very important position at the embassy uh, in London. Prince Turkey then becomes the ambassador to the United States and moves uh, to Washington to replace the long-standing ambassador, Prince Bandar. And he brings Jamal with him. And so Jamal then lives in Washington, D.C. for quite a period of time. He has children who were born there, U.S. citizens. And ultimately, Jamal uh, receives uh, permanent U.S. residency uh, several years later. But in the midst of all this, uh, Jamal returns to Saudi Arabia. He continues to write. Uh, he is hired to uh, run a, uh, a television show. I think it was based in Bahrain. And I want to read for you a couple of passages from an interview that he did with the Columbia Journalism Review. starts out, the questioner says, you're in imposed self-exile. This is while he was living in Washington, D.C. If that's the right way of putting it, can you maybe explain what came about that meant that you had to leave Saudi Arabia and what is your current living situation? He says, last June I decided to leave Saudi Arabia for safety. I felt that whatever space I had was getting narrower and I decided to leave. A few weeks after I left, arrests began to happen, and that made me appreciate being out. We never had freedom of the press in Saudi Arabia, it's true, but we also were never ordered or told to impose certain ideas. And if you do not say these ideas, you'll be judged. This is new. Many of my colleagues kind of disappeared from the media. They just want to be left alone. So basically, that's the reason I left, is my safety. I was under the risk of either being banned from travel, which would be suffocating, or being physically arrested, just like many of my colleagues. So the interviewer says, so you're saying that while press freedom in Saudi Arabia has never been good, you've seen a difference re recently in terms of what you're allowed to say, what ideas you're allowed to espouse. How do you see the role of Mohammed bin Salman in that turn. Answer, he's a transformer, and he thinks he should get everybody aligned with <coughs> ideas and views and suppress any counter ideas. I don't know where he got that idea. It's totally unneeded, totally hurtful, especially because there isn't a strong opposition in Saudi Arabia that he should fear. Basically, he wants to control the whole scene. He's a transformer. He wants to have a monopoly on the narrative, on the ideas that are being exchanged in Saudi Arabia. Total control. And right now he does have total control of the narratives in Saudi Arabia. He goes on to talk about the Western media response to Mohammed bin Salman. Mohammed bin Salman has been a reformer. 
he came up with this plan called Vision 2030, which basically involved uh, weaning Saudi Arabia off of its dependence on oil as its main source of revenue, providing education, diversifying the economy, uh, providing opportunities for women to be employed. And a year ago, he even finally allowed women to start driving. And so the Western media kind of glorified him. He came to Washington, D.C. He came to the U.S. He went out to Silicon Valley and met with the captains of industry in the high-tech arena. He went to Hollywood, uh, even agreed to invest in one of the largest uh, talent agencies and production houses out there. He's bringing movie theaters to Saudi Arabia, uh, joint ventures with movie companies here. And so the Western media really jumped on this. And he's a tall, handsome guy, charismatic personality. But Jamal says we missed this authoritarian bent that he has. And I think we did miss it. Uh, we started wondering, though, in 2017. In November of 2017, this same crown prince arrested and incarcerated two to three hundred Saudi royals and top-level business people and incarcerated them at the Ritz Carlton Hotel in Riyadh. Now you might say that's not, that's, that's kind of cushy. Well trust me, many of them were lying on pallets uh, in the ballroom. Uh, many of them were tortured. One general who was arrested never reappeared and is presumed dead. Others have recounted some of the tortures. Uh, Prince Abali bin Talal, one of the richest men in the world, was incarcerated there. I met with him actually in his office in Riyadh just a few months before he was arrested. Uh, when you see videos of his emergence from incarceration, you wouldn't think it was the same person. He was thin, gaunt, gray-haired, and a shadow of his former self. So I think we've got to start thinking back to November of 2017 as a time when the authoritarian bent of this crown prince started to manifest itself. And this wasn't the only extreme action that he took. He also managed to uh, incarcerate or at least briefly detain the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Hariri, who was a dual Saudi Lebanese citizen. Uh, he is responsible for the war in Yemen that has been going on now for about five years, uh, called by many, including the United Nations, the greatest humanitarian catastrophe on the planet today. And he has, in many ways, uh, presided over one failure after another. Uh, his big Vision 2030 plan was predicated on the sale of 5% of uh, Aramco. Saudi Aramco is the largest oil company in the world. It is what generates all of the revenue basically for Saudi Arabia. But that public offering never got off the ground. They didn't want to engage in the kind of disclosure you have to engage in in order to be listed on a stock exchange and satisfy the regulators. Footnote, last week Aramco was able to sell $12 billion worth of bonds to the public, which shows there is still an appetite, at least, for investment in Aramco. But after the fiasco in the Ritz Carlton, they then had a, a, an economic conference in Saudi Arabia uh, last October. Something very inconvenient came up before the October conference, though. And that was the murder of Jamal Khashoggi at the Turkish consulate, at the consulate, Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. Jamal was going to uh, complete his divorce and remarry uh, his Turkish fiance. And so he was advised, actually, by the Saudi ambassador to the United States, Prince Khalid bin Salman, the brother of Mohammed bin Salman and the son of the king, who was the ambassador to the U.S., that he needed to go to the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in order to have the paperwork finalized. 
So Jamal's fiance leaves him at the door. This is all on video. You've probably seen a bunch of it. Goes into the Turkish consulate, the Saudi consulate in Turkey. And he is met there by a hit squad of 15 Saudis who proceed to kill him and then most likely dismember his body, some of which is on tape, which the Turks had uh, e eavesdropping equipment to listen in on. And uh, his body, or parts of it, have still never been recovered. The Saudis initially denied that they were involved in this. They simply said he had disappeared. They continued one lie after another until they finally admitted that he had been killed in what they called a rogue operation by unauthorized Saudi individuals. Now these unauthorized Saudi individuals included a fellow named Saud al Qatani, who was one of the closest advisors to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He was a media advisor, a communications specialist, and the evidence has shown that he basically directed this hit squad, which by the way included a forensic expert, an expert who came in with a bone saw uh, through uh, the security devices at the airport. And these folks all left within a matter of hours after Jamal's murder. There's been an investigation. The United States has agreed that he was murdered, but the investigation and the consensus of uh, the intelligence community, not just ours, but uh, pretty much all of our allies, was that it's impossible that this murder occurred without the direct knowledge, if not approval, of Mohammed bin Salman. President Trump has been reluctant to agree to that potential. Uh, and has not punished or sanctioned uh, Mohammed bin Salman. We also have, though, in Congress a movement that is sparking outrage at this murder and the weak response to it, not just in the United States but around the world. We have an act called the Magnitsky Act, or the Global Magnitsky Act. Now, Magnitsky was a Russian lawyer who was a lawyer for a fellow named Bill Browder, who was the most successful foreign investment banker in Moscow, and whose uh, investment banking business was slowly being taken over by Russian oligarchs uh, and the Russian government. He protested, uh, finally uh, was able to escape Russia. <coughs> a lawyer who had been advocating on his behalf was poisoned by the Russian government and died. And Bill Browder went on a, a campaign to memorialize Magnitsky, and it was memorialized in the Global Magnitsky.